and welcome back. This is a lengthy build, so I appreciate you joining me. And please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Today, simple. We're just going to do a whole bunch more wrecker stuff. Uh, get some more of this bed built, and we'll also do some exhaust work since uh, those parts also had come in at the same time. So let's get started. Had a couple buddies stop by, so we went ahead and set the boom on the wrecker and finished welding some of the supports in. Then it was just off to cleaning up and painting a whole bunch of stuff. Parts of the boom, uh, parts of the sling, pulleys, uh, A-frame, things like that. We got those cleaned up, uh, reshot them with some paint, and I found some red paint that is going to be the same color of red that I paint the cab in. As I'm cleaning this stuff up and installing it, I discovered I needed new rubbers for the sling. They were just completely rotted. I was able to find a couple of sets on eBay, picked up some that were about the right size and installed them as needed. I also rebuilt the pins for the A-frame. Uh, found out later you can buy them pretty easy, but this was an easy repair anyway. So I went ahead and finished that up and started assembling the sling. Next was the bumper assembly, which does hold quite a bit of a load, so I wanted to make sure it was tough. Now, instead of buying a piece of channel, I went ahead and had a piece of quarter inch bent and broke at the correct height that I wanted for this. I just thought it would look better, kind of like that headache rack. Once I had the length determined, I clamped it in place and then mapped out where I wanted the lights, the tow bar, and the D-ring assemblies attached. At this point, I started welding bracketry from the wrecker frame that will eventually weld to the rear bumper, as well as I had to shim it up a little bit so that it was at the correct height for the sling. Pulled the bumper back off and was able to drill the holes for the sling and the A-frame, which made a conscious effort not to be interfering with the chassis or the wrecker frame so I could access them when the bumper's on. I also, at this time, went ahead and fully welded the receiver hitch and the D-rings on where I decided to place those. You can see the vertical plates on the wrecker frame plus the shims that I installed on the top bracket. That allowed me to set the bumper back on where I wanted it and then I fully welded the bumper to the wrecker frame. Once the bumper was fully mounted and welded to the wrecker frame, I went ahead and cut these plates for the ends of the bumper because I wanted it to look finished. Once I welded those plates in, I started grinding the edges down and trimming them down so that it looked like a completely finished product. I waited till the bumper was fully mounted to cut the taillight holes. That way I knew I wouldn't be interfering with uh, some frame or cross membering behind the bumper. Bumper all completed, I went ahead and primed it up and then started painting it. And I painted it a traditional uh, chevron stripe, which a lot of these wreckers had, but I used my flat black and then the regal red, which I'm gonna use the same color on the cab. Finished bumper, I think it looks pretty respectable. Just kind of clarify a couple of things. When I'm welding on this wrecker bed and I say I'm welding this frame together, I'm welding the frame for the wrecker bed together. Now, the wrecker bed itself is completely bolted on to the chassis frame, uh, which makes it kind of cool. This brace I put across the back over here, which I showed in some of those pictures, I can undo 17 bolts, disconnect the wire for the lighting and the the electric winch and you can crane this entire bed off of this chassis you know if someone ever bought this and decided they wanted to do something else besides have a wrecker on it it's removable without you know too much brain damage but that way when i say i'm welding to the frame of the wrecker i'm actually welding the wrecker frame itself not the chassis frame 
Took a break from the wrecker for a little bit. My exhaust came in, so I went ahead and installed this cross brace to the radiator headache rack as well as these tabs so that I had something to mount the exhaust to. And while I was welding on the headache rack, I went ahead and welded these posts to the headache rack. Uh, that way I could install a piece of expanded steel and that would act as a rock guard for the radiator, give it a little bit of protection. So these smokestacks are actually just automotive side pipes because there is a muffler, a glass pack inside of them. And I just mounted them vertically. I welded some tabs that made it to the tabs on the headache rack. And then the hard part was just figuring out how to connect the lower part to the header. I went down and got some of this flexi stuff here and just put the uh, collector pipe in here and then bent it around to get a shape of it. Then I was real careful taking it off, took the pieces to an exhaust shop and had them bend me a couple of pipes. Uh, I really didn't want this kind of pipe running to my exhaust. So I wanted a nice, good hard pipe and that's how I could get it without this thing running and without having to take it to an exhaust shop. Kind of cool, the exhaust shop only charged me 15 bucks for bending a couple of pieces of pipe. I brought them home, set them in where I wanted them tacked them in, then pulled them out and fully welded them. And now they're painted and ready to go in. Once I had everything welded and completely fit, I pulled it all back apart and all of the muffler pieces that needed to be painted, I painted with heat paint. Then I reinstalled everything to the wrecker, including the exhaust tips and the chrome covers. Now, a side note, once I had the cab back, I discovered these tips were too short and I ended up getting longer ones. Though this is mostly going to be for show, I still want to be able to tow with it if I need to. So I did go down to the local uh, crane rigging supplier and had them make me boom cables, uh, winch cables, and then ordered a full set of uh, J-hook tow chains. That way everything is rated for weight, strength, don't have to worry about it breaking. Uh, you can tow safely with it that way. Since we are working on multiple things at once, here's something we should start talking about. Yes, wiring, what everyone loves to do. Well, I actually do enjoy it. Uh, to me, wiring is therapeutic. I, I like doing it from scratch. I don't like trying to find someone else's bird nest of a mess. So all these builds I do, with very few exceptions, I'll strip all the wire out of it and start over. Uh, that really gets overwhelming for a lot of people because when you have a big trunk of wire coming through a firewall and you're trying to figure out where everything goes and how to make it work, sometimes it gets overwhelming. So first suggestion, do it in small steps. In getting started with wiring, something that some people find makes it a little easier. I've done enough of these now that I don't use the whiteboard. I just start wiring stuff. I, I've got enough in my head that I can really confuse people if you want to just follow me. But since we're doing this video and I've actually got me a young apprentice that's been helping me on some stuff lately because she wanted to learn how to do automotive wiring and it's really cool that some young people are still wanting to learn some of these uh, skills. But I myself really like wiring. So this might be a way of getting those of you who don't really like wiring to do wiring and, and successfully. So, we're wiring this entire chassis of the Epsys. So we're gonna kind of break this down into four-ish, three to four sections of a vehicle. And this one is just for a basic example. Usually by the time I'm done with one of these lists when I was doing these whiteboards, I'd have lists of stuff on every one of these sections. But for demonstration purposes, this is the front of the vehicle, this is the back of the vehicle, you know you're gonna have things on the front of the vehicle like headlights, park lights, probably some auxiliary lights, driving lights, maybe rock lights. Then you'll have an engine compartment area and firewall area. And you're gonna have an engine harness, especially if it's fuel injected or modern engine, you'll have a, a good engine harness up here. You'll have things like your uh, wiper motors, your heater motors, your air conditioning compressors, uh, I always put my fuse boxes under the hood of a car because I think it's easier to get to and diagnose rather than crawling under a dash and trying to figure it out. Now, big heads up on fuse boxes. I put two fuse boxes in. 
One of them will be a switched box, the other one will be unswitched. That way, some stuff you'll have to have the key on in order to get power to it, and other stuff will have power to it whether the key's on or not. So keep that in mind. In the passenger compartment, or I should say the middle of the car, you'll have things like your light switches, auxiliary switches, your signal switches, horn switches, wiper switches, gauges. Um, the other thing that's in the middle of the vehicle that a lot of people forget about is your transmission. Now, some transmissions will need a harness to operate them, which will come up from your engine down to there. Uh, other times you'll need just a backup switch or or something like that, a four x four switch if you're, you're running electronic transfer cases. But in the middle of the vehicle, there's gonna be some wiring too. Then you're gonna to get to the tail of the vehicle and we're gonna have things like our fuel pump back there, our fuel gauges back here, trailer light hookup, tail turn backup, auxiliaries, uh, brake lights, anything that's on the rear side of the vehicle. So you can kind of start itemizing those things and get yourself an idea of where you're gonna be running wires to and from. Now, when it comes to getting all this stuff, think about what size of wire if you're gonna be drawing a lot of current. Um, I usually wire most chassis in 16 gauge and 14 gauge, and then things like batteries uh, and alternators, you start getting into the eight gauges and number two wire, things like that. We'll talk about those later. For now, this is where we're gonna start, and we're gonna do it without getting too much confusion going on. A couple other little considerations here while we're starting this wiring is, not only do you wanna think about the size of wire and how much amperage is being drawn through it, because that's gonna determine a lot in your wiring size, you also wanna think about if you need to use a relay or not. Now, a lot of times people use relays and they don't need to. A lot of people don't use relays and they really should be using relays. Now, a good example of a relay is just a starter solenoid. That's nothing more than a relay. And what that does is it takes low amperage to control big amperage. So when I turn the key to the start position, it sends a small amount of amperage to the starter solenoid, even though it may be more amperage than you realize it's, it's using a small amount of amperage to engage that solenoid and then draw a lot of amperage from the battery through the starter. So on, for example, a start position in your key, you might be drawing 15 amps or something like that through that wire. I'd say that's probably a little high, but that 15 amps is triggering a solenoid and that solenoid or relay is now running 150 amps. So what we're doing is we're using small power to engage big power. And the reason you do that is you would have to have a monstrous key to be able to run that big wire into your dash and out of your dash and turn it. <laughs> so so you, you need something that's controllable. And that's why you use relays is to take small amounts of power and turn it into big power. Now, one of my little rules of thumb is 25, 30 amps, I'll start a relay. Um, I would prefer not using relays. You're gonna draw the same amount of power whether you use a relay or not. For example, you used to have to use a, a lot of relays for things like headlights and taillights. Well, if you use a switch that is rated high enough to allow the amperage for the headlights or taillights to go through it, and you're using a wire that will accommodate that amount of amperage safely, there's no need for a relay. Uh, on the other hand, say you are running a cooling fan that draws 30 amps, your switch is rated for 15 amps, Use your switch to engage a relay that is re rated for 40 amps. So your relay will be able to control the amperage going to the fan instead of all that power going through a switch that isn't rated. That's kind of where I stand on relays and you'll see how few of them I actually use. Remember I put the engine harness in the ammo box on the chassis. 
Uh, that way I don't have to run all the wires for it into the cab. But I ordered this harness from Affordable Fuel Injection. I think in the long run, an engine harness that's pre-built can save you a lot of money and a lot of time. Just be aware of what you're getting. You may have to alter that harness. This one I didn't have to alter at all, which was a really nice benefit. Starting on this chassis harness, first thing I did was installed a master switch. Since the battery is underneath, I can remotely turn off the battery and test circuits or keep my battery from drawing. Second thing I did was I mounted, again on that headache rack, a unswitched fuse block for running a lot of the exterior items that I knew I would not need to run through the cab, like the cooling fans. Remember, I'm not wiring anything in the cab yet, just chassis items. So I wired the beacon light, ran it down, wired the backup lights, ran that wire back, ran my fuel pump wiring, and a lot of my tail light, trailer light, um, all the hookups for uh, the chassis going forward as well. Now, as you're wiring this, you start running wire, and it ends up on the floor like this. So once I start getting the harnesses come together, I start running the wires straight and even, and then I'll run them into a large band, and where it comes from the rear to the front, it'll become a little bit larger band. Then I'll start taping sections, and once I get everything in line that's going up through the harness, I'll put it in a loom. This loom happens to come up to where the cab will mate with it. You notice I have the disconnect in here and it's all wired now. Now usually I'll hook these into the negative side because it's just one wire in, one wire out, and everything else uh, shuts down when you, you shut off this switch. This particular switch I wired through the positive because I wanted to be able to change it if I wanted to where I could isolate the boom from the rest of the chassis. So this one's wired into the positive side of the battery. One of the big cables here goes to the boom, the other one goes to the chassis, and the other one goes to the positive of the battery. Now, make sure you use big enough cable so that you don't have a voltage drop when something draws it, like a starter motor, something that really does draw a lot of current. I generally go with number two on battery cables unless I'm running clear to the back of the vehicle and have, you know, eight, 10 feet of cable. Then I'll go down to number one and make it really big. Usually the negatives, you don't have to run any bigger than uh, number two because you'll go from the battery right to a frame ground and then the frame to something else. So uh, you can get away with a little bit smaller on your negative side. But since we're doing the chassis wiring right now and getting the lights, tail lights, all the stuff coming down the frame rail, fuel pump, all that, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to mention the main battery wires. Here you can see the disconnect on the back side. I've got a main battery wire coming in. I've got a big wire coming out that goes to a common post and one that goes to the boom assembly. Then here you can see that common post since the battery is underneath. I needed something that was a little more accessible. So I've got the battery wire coming in and uh, number two going out to the starter number two and then the alternator key on key off fuse assemblies. On the alternator, I used eight gauge wire to go from the alternator to the battery. Then on the plug, one wire goes to a 12 volt key on source and the other wire goes to a separate circuit key on source with a resistor built into it. That way this alternator will function without having to go down and purchasing a one wire alternator. Well, that's gonna wrap it up. Uh, for this video, we got quite a bit done. Uh, got quite a bit of the chassis wiring done. The rest of the wiring will be done once the uh, cab gets set on this. Uh, we got most of the wrecker uh, put together. We'll finish up some decking and some other stuff like that. And we will try to get the body uh, set on the big hinge we built earlier. So thanks for joining. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. I do appreciate it. And uh, We'll exit with a few clips from Calamity Canyon.